Welcome everyone. And this is the end of the road here. We've got a final tomorrow. This is our final podcast previewing the big show between Tunisia and Algeria on December 18th. Uh, with me to review the semifinal action is uh, Meher, who uh, I think had to take a little bit of an emotional break following that crazy Algeria-Morocco game. Meher, how are you? I'm doing well, yeah. That was, uh, it was really, really stressful. Um, but I thought it was probably, I think it was the best game of the tournament. Algeria-Egypt was nice in terms of the intensity from the crowd. But I think Algeria and Morocco was so tight. And I think probably the highest quality of football that was played and the best goal of the tournament, am I mistaken? Uh, I think so. I, think so. You know, yeah. um, I don't want to be biased, but I was holding out to, for hope that Palestine would win that award with Mohamed yeah, yeah. goal, which was nice. But after the lady struck that, um, yeah, that is, they shouldn't even hold a vote. They should just give him the trophy for best goal of the tournament. And I think in 12 months time, he will definitely have a chance to win the uh, Puskas Goal of the Year Award. Uh, to get things started, let's recap what happened in the semifinals. Uh, Tunisia, as both of us predicted, they're through to the final. It's been a long and winding road. It hasn't been always straightforward at times. Teams that were maybe not at their level gave them a scare. Syria beat them at the group stage. Uh, Oman equalized late in their quarterfinal match before Tunisia pulled that one out. And this game also was pretty tight. Uh, Egypt, I think, had the better quality chances over 90 minutes. But then in the 95th minute, uh, Amr Suleya, really, really unfortunate. I thought he actually had a very good tournament for Egypt, uh, put the ball in the back of his own net following a Tunisian free kick. So the Carthage Eagles are into the final. And then uh, Qatar, Algeria, what happened uh, in that match, especially towards the end? I thought it was, I, I watched the game outside of here. I, I was trying to find a cafe. Every single cafe in downtown Algiers was packed. Um, I had mistakenly, like an idiot, I only went out 15 minutes before the match to try and find this cafe. I should have went an hour before. Um, so I was watching the game actually on the Metro steps with a friend and everybody's streaming on their phone at the same time on YouTube. So like we could only watch it in like 144, 240. <laughs> but the first half wasn't uh, wasn't that great anyways. It was kind of tight. I thought um, the coach Majid Bouguera said that he kind of wanted to play a slow rhythm because Algeria had played an extra time against Morocco. Uh, they were quite tired. He said they played six matches in 17 days. So the players were, you know, uh, quite tired. And I think he was very wary. He also said of Qatar's uh, counterattack especially with the likes of the speed of, of somebody like Akram Afif. So I think Algeria were not really pushing too much. They were holding the line share of possession and just kind of playing it around the back, attacking carefully, making sure they don't leave themselves too exposed. Um, in the second half, I thought they accelerated things. And I thought they, overall, I thought Algeria deserved to win that match. 1-0, um, 2-0. I thought they were the better side. They had the better chances. Uh, I didn't think Qatar created much. And I was actually shocked, especially like towards the last 10 minutes and throughout the 80th minute, uh, that from the 80th to the 90th minute, I thought Qatar didn't show any intensity to the point where like I was watching, eventually like as we're holding the phone on the metro steps, there was like 15 people behind us. And some of the, the Algerians behind us were saying, oh, these Qatari players, they don't, they don't care about Qatar. They don't like, they're, you know, they're of other nationalities anyways. Uh, that's why they're not trying hard. They're not like, look, why aren't they sprinting? Why aren't they? I felt like it was really low intensity to, to a certain extent, but maybe it was also the fatigue getting to them as well. We talked about Qatar maybe not having the depth of, of some of the other sides in this tournament um, in terms of the entire squad of 23 players. So towards really like the last few minutes, last five, 10 minutes, you know, you going into extra time, I thought Qatar started to pile it on in Algeria. Uh, made some negative substitutions that the coach Majid Bouguer was a little bit criticized for, taking off a striker, bringing on a central defender to defend crosses, which evidently didn't work because I thought Montari had a fantastic header. I love those headers where he sort of, he jumps up and just, you can see him like put everything into the ball. You know, yeah. it's so powerful. He just really, it's so satisfying sometimes and, and it hits the bar and it or hits the, the, the post and it goes in. I thought that was really satisfying. But that um, ball had to go to the, review, right? What was that? Mm. What was that about? Because we had a lot of extra so, time, or time added on, I should say, in this match. And one of the first delays was Montari's goal had to go for review. Why was it being reviewed? From what I understand, uh, so it wasn't the defender that was marking Montari. It was another defender, Jamed Amri, who seemed to be a little shoved, um, shoved like before the the header went in. 
I think that probably could have counted as a foul. The only thing I would say uh, to the credit of VAR is that I don't think there was any way Jamal Ben Amri could have made a play on that ball. You know, he was like the distance between him and Muntari was probably five to 10 meters. He was the other center half and he was shoved over here and the ball went way over his head. You know, for those of us that follow American football, it's like, you know, pa pass interference is only pass interference if it's a catchable ball, you know? Yeah. Uh, if it's like, I, I kind of understand the logic in that sense where like, okay, it was a shove, but there's no way he was going to make a play on that ball anyway. So should it have been whistled? I don't know. And it wasn't like a huge shove too, where like the arms extended. It was kind of like a shoulder barge. So I think it was, they probably did the right thing in letting the goal stand. Um, but yeah, the, the extra time was, the, I mean, the coach, Majid Bugir, I said, I thought the referee was fantastic the whole game, but I do not understand the nine minutes. How can you give nine minutes of extra time and then add an extra 10 minutes to the nine minutes of extra time? <laughs> it made no sense to me. 19 minutes of extra time. I, I don't think I've ever seen a game with that much extra time. I don't know about you, Bessie. Uh No, if I'm trying, I'm trying to rack my brain to think about what was there ever a time uh, that I saw that much extra time. I think there might have been a couple of games that I can remember. I, I can't really tell you who was playing, but... Uh, maybe a game where the goalkeeper had an injury and, uh, you know, there had to be on-field treatment. I, I, I roughly remember a game like that where then there was crazy extra time at the end. Um, a weather delay also uh, where it, they didn't call the game off and it just paused and then they played a bunch of extra time. I believe that mm. happened um, in Major League Soccer, I want to say, uh, out in Utah with a match involving Real, Real Salt Lake and another team. Uh, don't ask me to, to kind of point out who, but it was also crazy extra time. But understandable um you know the crazy extra times that i remember would have been something along the lines of nine or ten minutes i'm saying extra time it's time added on um and that probably would have been something in, in the african cup of nations where you know you kind of feel like the referee has to do that because there's so many shenanigans mm -hmm. going on in time wasting and to be honest there was some time wasting there were some injuries there were substitutions but like honestly if i was being completely honest i wouldn't have expected more than six seven minutes maximum nine was it's a little too much. And to be fair, even if he gave seven minutes, Qatar's goal still would have stood. So the extra time actually only benefited Algeria. But I just think that it was it was kind of absurd in a sense. And, and the coach, Majid Bouguera, said that the referee was almost, he came up to him before the, the fourth referee showed up the nine minutes and he told him, like, it's going to be nine minutes, okay? Like, as if he was negotiating or something. He thought that was a little bit bizarre. Yeah, it is strange. Um, I think the only other circumstance where I saw something along the lines of maybe nine or ten minutes uh, I believe uh, AFCON match, I think it was a quarterfinal between Morocco. I think it was Algeria, actually. I think that game had crazy time added on. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think Morocco scored in that time added on. Um, mm -hmm. Joad Ziedi, Ziedi, I think was the guy. Talking about 2004? You're taking yeah. us all the way back to 2004? Well, I mean, listen, <laughs> when you happen to have an Algerian on, you might remember these like embers uh, in my brain of... Uh, I still think that was like four or five minutes. I need to double check, but yeah, it might be like four or five minutes of extra time when they scored. They scored yeah. late though, yeah. But I mean, 18, yeah. the, the reason why we are referring to it as extra time and injury time or time added on, because it's like they played a half of uh, extra time. It was like back when we had that short period of silver goal. That's exactly mm. what happened. And quite mm. frankly, it looked like the Polish referee had instituted um, the rule that we all love. Next goal wins. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's what it amounted to. Because late, 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 late in uh, time added on, uh, Yassim Brahimi is fouled. Did we think that was a penalty? Clumsy challenge. I think... It's another one of those, you know, those 50-50s where I think, I think since there was contact, he didn't really make contact with the ball. Uh, Brahimi's leg was hit. I, I could see it being called as a penalty. I think it was fair enough, yeah. Uh, and then ensuing drama there because Beleli actually sees his spot kick saved by uh, Saad Sheep, and then he puts in the rebound and mm. Bedlam in Sue's Algeria on to the final of the 2020 mm. FIFA Arab Cup. Uh, and we've got a all North African matchup. And I think the dynamics here are very interesting. So we all know Egypt, Algeria, they don't like each other. They're rivals. Yeah. They remember what happened in Umm uh, 11, 12 years ago now with a spot at the World Cup on the line. Um, and the two matches that before that, that led for there to be a one-off playoff to determine the fifth and final African side to go to the 2010 World Cup. Uh, we know that 
Algeria and Morocco are also fierce rivals. There's also a political undertone uh, to that rivalry. Although when they played, I thought um, you didn't see much of that. You saw a lot of mutual mm. respect when those two sides played, but you could tell between the fans there was no love lost. And But this Tunisia-Algeria relationship, I don't think it's as testy. And what I saw in the match against Morocco, it seemed that there were a lot of Tunisians there supporting Algeria as if they had a common rivals rivalry so to speak so speak a little bit about that dynamic okay so from morocco tunisia and algeria honestly like if you take off borders you take out governments it's the same people honestly like ethnically language obviously religion food it's the same stuff like some people put fish in their couscous the tunisians some people put you know marguerite sausage in their couscous the moroccans some people just do it normal with chicken and, and meat. I guess everybody does that, but I was going to say Algeria. But, but it's really the same thing. So yeah. if you don't have really the, the governments going back and forth and, you know, like disputed territories like, like the Western Sahara, which is a problem for Algeria and Morocco, you, with Tunisia and Algeria, it's like as fraternal as it can get, it's as friendly as it can get. They really are like, and, and to, make, to make like it even more lovey-dovey, uh, many, many Algerian players have either played in Tunisia or have played in Tunisia. Um, and this is due to the fact that in North Africa, uh, a few different leagues, but especially Tunisia, they instituted a rule where um, anybody from the North African zone uh, is not considered a foreigner in their league. So they could buy as many Algerians, they could field 11 Algerian players if they wanted, whereas Algeria couldn't do that because they didn't institute the same rule in Algeria. The Tunisians still count as foreigners. And as a result, um, there was a huge like talent drain out of the Algerian league into the Tunisian league um, because they pay better salaries there, especially the top four clubs in Tunisia. Algeria has more of a balanced league where from top to bottom, it's a lot closer. So the worst Algerian teams are better than the worst Tunisian teams, but the top four in Tunisia, Esperance, Etoile du Sahel, um, Club African, and it's you fun. can throw in CS Fox in there. Yeah, yeah. Those are like, they're at another level than probably Algeria's best clubs. So players like Yusuf Belayli played at Esperance, Baghdad Bounidjah played at Etoile du Sahel, Elias Shetty, the left back, playing, currently playing for Esperance, Abdul Qadir Badran, uh, Mohamed Amin Tougat. All these guys are, have, have played in Tunisia or, or are playing in Tunisia at the moment. So they know the Tunisians very well and vice versa. So it really is like, a, like they are, like, they've become best friends with some of these players. You know, they live with some of these players. And so it really is like, uh, it's going to be, it, it, all North African derbies are going to be intense and cagey and physical, but there really is like a, a, a loving sentiment like that permeates this. And I, I really feel like whoever wins, the other side is going to be happy for them. Everybody's going to want to win, but it, it really is really fraternal, really friendly. Yeah, 100%. I think we're all looking forward to it. I have to say from uh, the perspective of the bracket, I don't think you can argue this. Uh, we got the two best sides. I think perhaps uh, everyone would have wanted to see Morocco, Algeria as a final, but Morocco, the yeah. bracket uh, was, you know, divided, organized depending uh, depending on the um, group standings. I think this is the the two best teams from either side of the bracket and uh, a worthy worthy final. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some faces that didn't make it all over here. I want to put together a team of the tournament. Uh, Maher, you will have the task of putting together a team based on just the best players. Uh, I will put together a team that is the best player from each nation. So no, uh, no more than one nationality in my starting 11. That means I have to use 11 and then exclude uh, five national teams. I've got mine written down here. But Maher, uh, you do us the honors and let us know what your best 11 looks like uh, in this tournament. Okay, so I have striker. I'm going to put our pick for um, to finish top score. We both, before the tournament, thought it was going to be the top score. I'm going to put Saif Adin Jaziri, even though I think he could have been a little sharper, could have scored a few more goals. His movement and his um, instincts in front of goal have obviously led him to be the top scorer so far. I hope he stays at four goals and doesn't score a fifth, but I'll put him as my striker. I think the best player in the tournament overall has been Yusuf Beledi from Algeria, uh, scored some wonder goals and has been so good that he's this tournament has earned him a move to Europe. So yesterday he resiliated a contract with uh, Qatar AC, Um, and now there are rumors that he'll be heading to France to play football uh, for either Montpellier or Saint-Étienne. 
uh, in the next few days. So that's uh, some breaking news there as well. Uh, I'm going to put Akram Afif on the other side of the lady. Uh, four assists, two goals. Um, another player that I thought could have actually done better. He had a very solid tournament, but I think he could have done uh, a little bit better. But I have him as my right winger and somebody that I'm looking forward to seeing at the World Cup because I just love his pace. I love um, his even his combativity. He really took it to the Algerians, uh, even though they weren't too effective on the counterattack. But I'll, I'll credit that more with Algeria's tactics than Qatar's uh, efficiencies. I give me Rafat from Egypt uh, to finish out the attacking midfield. Scored some very important goals. Um, I'm, I played a double pivot, an Algerian Moroccan double pivot of uh, Shabran and Ben Dibka. As a right back, I was really, really, I didn't know who to put between uh, the darling of my tournament so far, should be the Moroccan right back who we spoke about, had, sort of came out of nowhere for me. I didn't really know him that well before, uh, had important goals, important assists. But the Tunisian, uh, the, the Draguer, came on and he actually had a, a pretty decent tournament. He arrived late because his club didn't let him uh, join the, the Tunisian team at the beginning of the tournament. But since he's been there, Tunisia have looked like a different side, especially defensively. Uh, he won one man of match award. So I thought, I think I'm going to go with Drag Air from there since we already have him rocking. I'm going to steal Bedr Benun uh, as a center half. You told me he has three goals. I didn't realize that until you told me that. Um, but yeah, he's somebody that doesn't miss penalties. Um, very good penalty kick taker, very good in the air. He scored an important goal against Algeria to sort of help Morocco back into that game. Uh, you know what? I'm going to put... Give me both Dragger and Shibi on as, as fullbacks. And I'm going to take Elias Shiti from Algeria, the left back, and move him in. Uh, he can do that. I think that he's actually been one of the most satisfying players from the Algerian side. We knew he was solid. He had some experience with the A team before. We didn't really know if he was a serious pretender to play a backup role to Rami Bin Sabaini, who plays for Borussia Mönchengladbach, who is the starting left back for Algeria. But and Algeria has so many options at left back. There's like a list of eight to nine talented prospects that we think could play that position for the Algerian national team. Elias Shetty really rocketed his way up, and I think he's probably second or third in that now. Um, he was probably fifth or sixth before, but I think he's really done so, so well. Uh, and I think his best match was probably the Qatar match, so he's been playing better as the tournament goes on. Um, goalkeeper, I didn't really didn't really have. I, like a men's goalkeeper did okay. Um, uh, I didn't really have, like... A, some I I just put Rais and Bonhe Algeria's goalkeeper who I thought didn't had an okay game yesterday, but I wasn't really too impressed with the standard of goalkeeping uh, as a whole for this tournament. So uh, that's my hastily put together team of the tournament. But uh, I'm more looking forward to you. More, more looking forward to yours. Yeah, um, I would say putting together my best eleven using only one nationality uh, per position or per for for the entire team. So no repeats. Basically, you pick one Algerian. There can only be one. There cannot be two. Um, made things difficult, but then it also meant that I had to think forwardly about all the games we watched. Uh, and I think one thing listeners of this podcast will realize that we gave everyone a fair shot. We spoke about everyone in this tournament. Uh, we spoke about Sudan, Mauritania, nobody was left out. Um, I, I would agree with you that I'll start from goalkeeper and work my way forward. This was not a great tournament for, for goalkeepers. It was really hard to pick one that stood out. I thought, uh, Morocco's goalkeeper and was was good. Um, maybe if he had been just a little bit better with, with the, the penalty kick uh, that I believe it was Bilili who scored to open up the, the scoring in that match. Um, maybe if he was better in the penalty kick shootout, it would have been different and I would have had him as my goalkeeper, but then that would have meant I couldn't include another Moroccan. So I went with an alternative uh, pick. I went with Mustafa Matar of Lebanon. Um, and I think also for him, you know, he didn't get a clean sheet because they rotated goalkeepers for that final group match, but he would have had a, a clean sheet against Sudan. And then against Egypt and uh, Algeria, really, Lebanon was only in that game because Matar stood on his head and made really good saves. And I think for a young man that was the third choice goalkeeper for his country up until uh, September of this year, uh, he's just come on in strides. And if he continues like this, I don't think it'll be very long until people start mentioning him as uh, one of the best goalkeepers in Asia, uh, because goalkeeper in Asia, as far as the standard, isn't great. So Mustafa Matar from Lebanon is my goalkeeper. Uh, we have some overlap on the defensive line. I also was impressed with um, Hamad Rager. He is my 
uh, right back. So that's Tunisia's rep uh, representation uh, sealed and done with. Uh, Bedir Benoun is not only my Moroccan representative, he's my captain. I thought he was excellent every game he played, uh, leader by example, made it super hard uh, for teams to penetrate that Algerian defense up until they came up against um, uh, Algeria. So uh, Bedir Benoun uh, from Morocco is my captain and one of my center backs. I had to go a little bit alternative. Uh, and if Hassanin was here, I think he would approve of this pick. His center back partner is uh, Munaf Yunus. Uh, as a 25-year-old who hadn't played for his country before this tournament, I thought he had a really, really solid tournament. Iraq, obviously one of the disappointments, but if we look at their performance on the field, I don't think defensively that was the issue. They kept... Uh, a clean sheet against uh, Oman, oh, no, sorry, a clean sheet against Bahrain, and then against Oman, they only conceded a penalty kick. And for 80 minutes, they were keeping a clean sheet against Qatar before things fell apart. So I think Munaf Yunus is one of these guys that took the opportunity by the scruff of the neck, and I think he will be involved with Iraq going forward. So that is Iraq's representative done uh, with. Left back, not a great tournament for left backs. Very, very difficult for me to identify one guy that really stood out. I will go with um, Abdul Karim Hassan, Qatar's left back. Uh, he's just a solid performer for them, very consistent, was Asian player of the year a couple of years ago. Um, and I look forward to seeing him at the World Cup. I think he's well positioned that if he keeps his consistency to have a, a good World Cup next year. Uh, midfield, I had to pick an Egyptian. Uh, I put together this starting 11 before uh, the unfortunate incident uh, in the Tunisia game, but Amir today I think was one of the most consistent um, contributors for Egypt, a guy who plays a big role for that league, but not necessarily a big role for the national team. I think he really solidified um, his presence at next month's African Cup of Nations and potentially at next year's World Cup should Egypt qualify. Uh, then I had to start getting a little bit uh, creative in my selections because I had exhausted all the North African sides. Um, and as such, I uh, then had to draw upon Syria. Uh, and I think one young man who had a really good tournament, again, didn't play for his country before uh, the start of this tournament, Oliver uh, Kosko, who scored the, the first goal against Tunisia. You know, as a as a box to box slash holding midfielder, I think he was just really solid in this tournament. He's only eighteen or nineteen years old, um, and I think he's one of the one of the re revelations from a Syrian perspective. They will um, be better uh, in World Cup qualifying with him in the side. Uh, so, although they lost the battle to get out of the group, I think they won the war because him, alongside some other Syrian players that will now be part of their squad going forward, uh, should help them to try and wrest uh, away that third place spot from the UAE in World Cup qualifying group A in Asia. Uh, I was hard pressed then to um, pick some other players, but I thought, you know, Oman needed to be included in this starting 11. Uh, Shad Alawi scored two goals. Uh, one to get them out of the group uh, against Bahrain in a 3-0 win, and then a really, really nice goal against Tunisia. He's only 18 or 19 years old as well, so a young player and a guy I thought really punched above his weight in this tournament. So um, and I think fair, fair play to Oman for a, uh, a, a good tournament, a really, really solid, solid tournament. Uh, they have no reason to be ashamed with what they uh, put together on the pitch in Qatar. And then for my front three, um, I said I exhausted my North African options, but I kept one, one, just one. Yusuf Bilali has to be my left winger. There's nothing more I can say about him. Just go watch that goal he scored against Morocco. He's, he's amazing. Uh, and then <laughs> I was really, really, really scrappy, scraping at the bottom of the barrel for my last two. So my striker, uh, is going to be Yezin Namat, the Jordanian. Uh, look, I thought he was super energetic and, and had a goal ruled out in that first match against Saudi Arabia, uh, controversially by VAR. Uh, then he got injured. He missed uh, that Morocco game. He came back as a substitute in the Palestine game, scored two goals to put it out of uh, reach. But I was really more impressed with uh, his maturity against Egypt. Uh, obviously opened up the scoring in that game. Could have had a couple of more. I think he wreaked havoc on the Egyptian defense. And again, one of these guys that was on the Olympic level made this step up only the past couple of months to the senior team level. And I think Jordan has really found um, a guy that can lead the line for them going forward. And then last but definitely not least, uh, you knew I had to include a Palestinian player, but I'm telling you it is on merit. Go back and watch 
his game against Saudi Arabia and his game against Jordan. Tamer uh, Sion, if you just look at the body of his work with the national team, I always used to criticize him that he would go missing for long spells in games. Uh, that was not the case, at least in the last uh, two games of the group stage for Palestine. Uh, 49 caps overall for Palestine. He has 13 assists and 11 goals. Um, he assisted Palestine's goal against Saudi Arabia, and then he scored Palestine's goal against Jordan. And if Khalid Salem <laughs> could finish, I am telling you, he would have three or four assists because Khalid Salem was insistent to waste his super, super good service. He also had a goal very, 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 very narrowly ruled out by VAR that would have made it 2-2. Um, this was a man that was determined to get Palestine, I think, out of the group, but... Um, let's just say fortunes conspired against them. So that is my starting 11. That does mean I leave out five national teams. Let me tell you why I left out those five. Um, Sudan and Bahrain, you didn't score a goal in this entire tournament. So no, I watched your games. Uh, Sudan, you fired your coach. I really hope that works out for you because I don't think the coach was the biggest problem there. If you could fire a national team, I would fire a lot of guys in that Sudan team. Um, Mauritania, from a consistency standpoint, I think they got better with every game in this tournament, but there wasn't a guy who put together two good performances for me to kind of work him into this starting 11. Uh, and then uh, UAE, um, look, I know they got out of the group, but they got, worse. they got worse with every game in this group. And then that 5-0 loss against Qatar is so unacceptable. And not only that, I mentioned in the last podcast that when they came out for the post-match interview uh you know they i know it was with a player that didn't start and he came on at halftime but i am a put you are one of the leaders in this team you are the leading scorer of your nation all time you can't come out and just be like oh well you know i thought it was better than us and you have to have that fire that passion and i did not see fire or passion at all from the emirati side probably it will result in van marvik losing his job but I think there needs to be a complete rethink because this is a team that is living off the embers of the 2015 uh, semifinalists, that golden generation. I mean, the defensive line is so old. I mean, there's just a bunch of guys in their mid thirties and they got exposed um, by the speed and the tenacity of Qatar's attack. But then a lot of times, you know, they were given up penalties and, and scoring own goals. That's something that shouldn't happen if you have, uh, experience in the back so yeah controversial maybe to keep out an emirati and include you know some of the other nationalities but i don't think any emirati person can sit here and say oh well this player had a really good tournament or we use this tournament and we gave an opportunity to x player or y player and as a result we'll be better for it going forward i think completely wasted opportunity and then the last but not least saudi arabia listen respect the tournament show up with the strongest yeah. possible 11 you could have fielded um, you know, if you wanted to keep one or two players out because they needed rest, I understand. Uh, but you went and said, okay, we'll use six players who have experience and 17 who've never played for the national team before. Uh, they could have gotten out of this group with just a little bit more experience had they decided to include that, but they disrespected the tournament. I think Saudi players, uh, Saudi fans, uh, Saudi journalists will look back at this as a missed opportunity because this was really, I think, uh, you know, what they call a uh, uh, world cup for the Arabs and Saudi Arabia has the history and has the quality to do better. And really they were lucky to even get a point in, in that group. Uh, so that is why I excluded those five, um, five countries. My apologies to anyone who doesn't agree, but it's my podcast. So I'll do what I want. Uh, <laughs> let's get on. I think our final, uh, uh, point to make here is what's going to happen in this final. Uh, controversially, both Maher and I uh, picked Tunisia to win. Uh, are you going to court controversy, Maher, and, and stick with that? They are playing your Algerian national. No, I'm a coward. I'm going to. No, honestly, I for I did think from the very beginning that if you look down to the individual players, I thought Algeria had the best three or four individual players. And for them to make it this far, for them to win the tournament, those, those best players, those individuals that have to perform at a very high level. And thankfully, we've gotten that from uh, Yassin Brahimi, Yusuf Belayli, uh, Baghdad Bounijah at times as well. Um, Raisin Boyd has the goalkeeper. So 
I think I've seen enough from Algeria's top players and I've seen progressive improvement from the coach as well, Majid Bouguera. Uh, the first match against, uh, the second match of the group stages against Egypt, I didn't see like um, coordinated pressing. I didn't, I thought we were out, out coached in that match. Uh, I did see progressive improvements against Morocco and against Qatar where I thought, wow, this he's doing some good things. Even though I didn't agree with the selection of the squad, I didn't agree with some of the substitutions he made, I do see some progressive improvements. So I think I've seen enough from Algeria um, that I think it, they could win this match. <clears throat> it is going to be, it's a derby, it's North African derby. Like these sides are pretty well evenly matched. It's going to be 50-50 or 55-45, but I do think Algeria is going to come through. Yeah, and you know, obviously as the neutral party here, uh, both teams are kind of courting my heart because obviously we know Algeria's relationship with Palestine amongst the fans, amongst the players. Uh, one of the they copied things, us. Yeah, one of the first things Algeria did, and they do it often, uh, fans bring Palestinian flags, they bring kofiyas. Uh, I do remember the scenes of after beating Morocco on the penalty kick shootout. They grabbed Algerian flags and almost simultaneously at the same time, they grabbed Palestinian flags as well. <laughs> And Tunisia, I mean, it's not that their fans don't bring Palestinian flags. Um, they're just maybe not as known for it. Uh, I didn't see as much of that, I think, at the World Cup in 2018. Uh, okay, you know, I respect the support, but then it was it was a little interesting <laughs> to see them grab a Palestinian yeah. flag and to try and 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 what Algeria. Um, I don't know why they're they're courting Palestinian support so so hard. But you guys should be suspicious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen. I think uh, Tunisia. Uh, I've always enjoyed watching them play. I always thought, you know, uh, from the contingent of the four big North African sides, they're probably the side with the. They're obviously the smallest country, and they're the side with the mm. least talent. But they always seem to overachieve uh, with the talent. I, I remember that. You know, this is a side that was at the 98 World Cup, the 2002 World Cup, the 2006 World Cup, um, and then 2000, okay, this is a bit of a hiatus, 2018. But obviously growing up and seeing them in those successive World Cups at the expense of Egypt, who had uh, more famous players, Morocco, who had more famous players. Uh, it was pretty like, wow, you know, they're, they're actually doing something here. And then, you know, to see them at the last World Cup, although Algeria was everyone's darling, I had so, so much talent. Just goes to show that there's something special with this Tunisian side. Uh, I I think uh, Algeria has uh, has my heart, uh, but I want to remain consistent. I've never gone back on any of my predictions as we've done this podcast series, so I'll stick with Tunisia. Uh, an interesting point that I'm thinking about is that after the loss against Syria, you came on this podcast and you told us uh, that Monsar Per was coaching for his job and in order to keep his job. He need to win the Arab Cup. Is that still the case? Do you know of any new developments on that front? I spoke to some Tunisians in the know before we recorded this podcast. They told me even if he wins, they think he'll still be gone. So, uh, which would be, I think, a little bit harsh. But he's felt the pressure during this tournament. He's managed to do a pretty good job of getting Tunisia to the final. Um, I almost thought that maybe he'd coached his way into keeping his job. Uh, for the AFCON. But from what I'm being told, even if he does go to the AFCON, he's not going to be there for the World for World Cup qualifying. Just relaying what I'm hearing, that's all, from sources that I trust. Um, I don't think Mundar Kveir is going to be the coach going into the World Cup playoffs in March. I mean, that's pretty controversial right there because even mm. only to bring in a new guy, he'll be using AFCON as a bit of an, uh, a test period for his players, which is not what you want in a, in a continental showpiece. That doesn't seem like great planning. And on that point, are we even going to have an African continental showpiece? Because English outlets have almost been insistent that this thing is going to get canceled for potential bombings at stadiums and COVID. Yeah, yeah. We've used that <coughs> little excuse in the book. Nothing new. This is happening, right? It's 100% happening. Whether, even if for somehow, some way, the European clubs manage to unite and say, we're not sending our players and you guys can take us to uh, FIFA and you guys can sue us or whatever, it's going to happen with local players. The African Cup of Nations is going to happen. Uh, we've all booked our tickets, including CAF. We've all booked our hotels. We've all been accredited. Um, it's happening. Um, yeah, as for the decision to fire Kbeir, I like I said, I think it would be a little bit controversial, but I think the, the main thing that did him in were those last two uh, match days of World Cup qualifying uh, when Tunisia 
being chased by Equatorial Guinea. They should have wrapped it up after four or five match days, but they just didn't, never really looked convincing. Even the times they did win, was never really beautiful. was never well done. It was never, they never like put teams away, like, you know, six nil, seven nil. I know that's asking a lot, but that's, people feel like, okay, like Tunisia, you have to understand, we call them the Germans of Africa because they, I think they've qualified to every single cup of nations since, I want to say like 92 or something like that, or 94. It's like something ridiculous like that. As you mentioned, they've qualified so many world cups. They're, all, they're known for like getting to the tournament and then especially for the Cup of Nations, they'll make it to like a quarterfinal or a semifinal and always just like stumble and, and you know, and be knocked out. And I think people are sick of that. They're like, we need like a coach to come in and take us all the way. We don't, we're sick of like making it to the quarterfinals and the semis and then being knocked out due to mediocre coaching or due to last time it was like some fluke goals that they conceded. Uh, and it always seems to happen. Um, the 2015 AFCON, the 2019 AFCON. So I really, I can understand where some of the supporters are coming from. And, and Munda Tbeir, actually, during this tournament, I believe it was after the Amman match, I think he was emotional. He almost like started crying because like, he said like, if you guys don't want to like support me, at least support the players, like speaking to the fans. Like he's, he could, he can feel the pressure that like from, from the fans, you know? Um, so he was being emotional. And again, I, I understand how from the exterior, this kind of seems absurd. You're in the finals of the Arab Cup and, you know, uh, you have a, a continental tournament in a month's time, less than a month's time, in three weeks' time. And then after that, it's only two months until the World Cup playoffs. But Tunisians just feel like they've seen his limit, his maximum, and it's not going to be good enough when it's time to, to really put the pedal to the metal. It's not going to be good enough. So I can understand both sides of the equation. Again, I would be extremely surprised if he's the coach uh, heading into the World Cup qualifying, and I would be a little surprised if he is. Uh, actually, I expect, I don't know. I'm not sure about the AFCON, but World Cup qualifying, I would be extremely surprised. Yeah, and it's a little bit ironic. They're looking for a coach to take them all the way. And yeah. the player could, could do that. I mean, he has made it to a final. That's the first final I think Tunisia has made um, since they won the 2004 African Cup of Nations yeah. on soil. So they're exactly. might just looking at the guy who could deliver it um, I find it a little bit strange. You know, I think for me, if you were going to do that, if you're going to make a coaching change, you needed to pull yeah, do it before the, the Arab Cup. Before the Arab Cup. And we saw some yeah. of the nations do that. Uh, Syria is the one that comes to mind that they said, okay, we're done doing this. We've got a World Cup uh, qualification campaign in peril, but we've got the Arab Cup. Let's bring in a new coach. Uh, he can use this as a breeding ground for some players, try, try out his tactics with a core group that will be there in World Cup qualifying, and then we take it from there. Uh, now you're just talking about, you know, the, maybe using AFCON as that opportunity, and then worst case scenario, not even be able to use AFCON, and then what, you bring in a guy, he doesn't know the players, uh, and he's got a couple of trainings well, before... They could bring in... They could bring in somebody that does know the players. They could bring in another Nabil Ma'lul or, you know, something like that again, or... Uh... Um, Jose Benzerti or like another Tunisian that you know has a lot of experience with the Tunisian national team that knows the players they could do something like that but the last Benzerti experiment didn't really work out Nabil Ma'lul could be an option I think it could be a serious option for them yeah Nabil Ma'lul uh, to be honest with you I had high hopes for his uh, time with Syria I thought he'd be able to unlock something from them but if anything they looked um, just as bad as they did all of 2019 and I don't see how he gets his way back into uh, Tunisia's national team. I mean, credit to him for a successful qualifying campaign four years ago. Um, yeah. I just don't. And that see was impressive. They yeah, were really good in that. Qualifying. I just don't see how he goes back because what I saw at the finals was a team that was not quite able to compete with the upper echelon. Uh, yeah, they did. They played well enough against England. They were unlucky to lose that game. But again, you know, it's all about the details. I remember that game, Harry Kane, I think, scored off of two set pieces or last minute corner. Uh, they should have mm. got at least a point from there. And then against Belgium, they were fine going into attack, but Belgium completely ripped them up in defense. Uh, so yeah. I don't know. I think it's a big question mark. I do think, you know, I have this feeling that the players are in a siege mentality right now. Bayer is obviously in that siege mentality. And I think that might give them the slight mental edge in a very tight match uh, tomorrow. So I, 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 I don't know why, because everything, you know, from the players, how they played, 
uh, the matches we've seen, says Algeria is an unstoppable force. They knocked out Morocco, which I think that was a big surprise for a lot of people, having seen what Morocco did with the Arab yeah. world in the group stage. Uh, and let's not forget, that was a difficult group. I think a lot of people are going to dismiss the fact that, oh, it wasn't a great group. Look what Jordan did against Egypt. They took him mm. all the way to extra time. Extra time. You know, Palestine was better than Jordan, right? Like they scored that second goal to make it 2-2. They could have gotten out of the groups. And Saudi Arabia was, I think, good value for money, even with an experimental side. They were not pushovers. There was not one team in this group that was just a joke. Um, and we can all point at the other groups and identify kind of the jokey sides, you know, sides that couldn't score a goal, uh, goalkeepers who punched the ball into their own net, despite yeah. the ball being go going in the other direction. The, in Group C, there wasn't any of that. So I think Algeria did a really good job to, to, to knock Morocco out. Um, but also, I think, you know, the fact that they had to go 120 minutes against Morocco, the fact that they had to go uh, 90 plus 19 minutes <laughs> against uh, against Qatar, and they're already tired going into that match. I think those are just little things that might lead uh, to Tunisia winning this. And if they do, I really want to see what the Tunisian FA is going to come up with as an answer to Munzer Kaber basically um, pushing all his chips into the middle of the table, doubling down and saying, OK, yeah, you want to fire me? Well, I just delivered a trophy. So if you're going to fire me, you're going to fire the man who's delivered you the first major trophy in 17 years, based on yeah. the fact that we didn't mess up World Cup qualifying. We had a stumble and we recovered. Uh, so I think very interesting times and a very interesting subplot uh, for this uh, for this final. Um, any final thoughts before we wrap up our last podcast of uh, the FIFA Arab Cup? Yeah, I think one thing I would say is that I didn't really know what to expect going into this Arab Cup. I mean, in the past, to be completely honest, Bessie, it wasn't a tournament that was like really, really taken too seriously here, not to the level of an African Cup of Nations uh, or, of course, of a World Cup. But I was actually very impressed, not, not only with, you know, the, the infrastructure, the, I thought, of, uh, decent enough number of fans i mean compared to the to the expectations I ended up showing up um but but here in algeria i was really impressed with the anticipation of like people like really like looking forward to these matches big screens being installed you know around algiers um you know everybody like every everybody talks about it you know like everybody's like setting like the schedule hey where are we going to go watch the match tomorrow and then like the celebrations after the match so that's one of the things that I've been like super impressed with is, yeah, this has been a successful tournament, not only like in terms of preparation for the 2022 World Cup, but also I think it really managed to capture the attention of not just Algerians. I've seen, you know, all, all the Arabs really talk about this tournament. I went to a wedding uh, just like two weeks ago. It was an Algerian Sudanese wedding and Sudanese, even though they didn't have the greatest side, were, were following all the matches. Uh, there was another, there was a Palestinian guy there, same thing, following all the matches. So. I think this was really uh, a great tournament in the sense that it really put the Arab Cup back to where it needs to be. And I hope it can be a regular competition now and it can be always taken seriously, not just when FIFA comes in and helps organize it a year before the World Cup. Yeah, 100%. I echo that sentiment. I really hope that the powers that be come together after this and whether with FIFA's help or not with FIFA's help, just an independent UAFA thing, that they say, okay, this tournament needs to be scheduled every two or four years. Um, and that there's going to be prize money and sponsorship to see this happening because it mattered. You know, people kind of called it a friendly tournament before, but I did not see anybody take this tournament lightly, maybe with the exception of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. <laughs> even, then, even then, you know, they cannot do that again. Uh, their press will not allow it. Their fans will not allow it. So I'm definitely looking forward uh, to see, uh, hopefully, hopefully that we uh, get a regular cadence to this tournament. Matt, I want to thank you for taking the time to cover this and for all your work you did on our podcast series. For everyone who would listen to subscribe, thank you as well. Hopefully, if this is a regular tournament, we can make this podcast a regular thing. Uh, until then, please like, share, subscribe on YouTube, on Spotify to this uh, podcast. It really means a lot to us. Thank you for being with us on this amazing journey covering the FIFA Arab Cup. And I can't wait to see you all again next year for the World Cup 2022 in Qatar. So until then, enjoy the final, enjoy the third place match, which we didn't get to, but hey, nobody takes third place matches seriously. Yeah. So we didn't, <laughs> forgive us for that. 
Thanks for your time, everybody. Enjoy the final. Enjoy that third place match if you're going to watch it as well. And we will see you maybe sometime soon. I guess we'll have to talk to the UAFA about that. Uh, until then, take care, Matt. Thank you for being here. Thank you to all our contributors who weren't here today but helped along the way. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. So hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we see uh, a deserving side, whether it's Tunisia or Algeria, lift that trophy tomorrow on December 18th. Bye for now.